thoughts are after we've gone through the episode, or if you're watching this after it's already gone live, definitely just drop a comment in there and let us know what you think. But uh, with all that being said, we've got a couple different topics we wanted to touch on today. So the first big thing is we're actually going to have Bill walk us through sort of the history of Stage 3 and how the company got to the point of where it is today. Uh, we also want to talk a little bit about some of the weird vehicles that we've owned in our past and some of the things that have gone in and out of our garages. And then we'll probably touch a little bit on some Ford news as well and things surrounding like the electric Rivian trucks or the new Bronco, stuff like that. So let's just jump right into it and I guess we'll start off with the Stage 3 history stuff. All right, well, um, so I was 20 years old and I was working for a kit car manufacturer in California. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had some connections, we were selling some parts, and I saw an opportunity to get into the Mustang parts world. So I left California, went back to Iowa where I was from. My family had a furniture store, so I used the basement of the furniture store to stock product and um, start selling. So I made a deal with the guy next door to the furniture store that uh, I would clean up this old abandoned building. <laughs> and if I did some sweat labor there, he would let me rent it really cheap. And so I would stock stuff and pack and ship it from there. And it's like all great companies that have to start in a garage. Exactly. Like Apple yeah. Or yeah. I don't know if ours was a garage. <laughs> ours was a basement. From your furniture store basement yeah. startup. Yeah. yeah. In the middle of Iowa. So. Um, okay. Uh, so I started doing that. I started with Roush, Celine, some of the other uh, companies there. We were doing Mustang parts and NASCAR accessories. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> Midwest in, in 04, mask, NASCAR accessories were big. Yeah, can um, you specify like what kind of NASCAR accessories <laughs> we're talking about? Because you so, already know the answer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just to be clear for everybody. Uh, so NASCAR blankets, throw blankets, mm -hmm. pillows, and uh, these chairs, like kind of gaming chairs. Yeah. Um, the, the furniture store was a dealer for, I think it was called Race Brands, and they wouldn't sell that stuff, <laughs> so I did. <laughs> we carried it for a couple of years. Um, but but Mustang parts was a bigger part of our business. The, yeah, the, the main focus. Yeah, I'm glad it did go down that path, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah, and we're not still a NASCAR furniture retail yeah, accessory place. Yeah. Um, after a couple of years, I moved to Arizona. It was still just me. Packing, shipping, answering phones, all that stuff. And then um, we got our first employee, 06, 07. Um, at that point, it was just customers that I decided I could hire. Mm -hmm. So I could bring those guys in. And... Uh, no real job descriptions, you know, pretty startup. I mean, everyone just kind of did whatever, you know. Yeah. Like, Employee of stage three. Yeah, is exactly. The, the like cordless phone, like you grab it, I got to pack <laughs> stuff, you know. Uh, and we're trying to do retail also, so mm -hmm. that someone would walk in and you had to stop shipping and work with them. Um, and then we moved each year. So if you knew us from being around the valley, uh, we, we were growing, which was great. Mm -hmm. But that meant that every year we would move and get a bigger warehouse and a couple more employees and all that fun stuff. So uh, then around 2011, we got into truck. Um, I had had some other big diesels. John had had some big diesels that works here. And we were uh, driving a lot of trucks, but we weren't really doing truck product. Yeah, you guys uh, had those super duties, but it was like yeah. almost all Mustang focused still yeah. until 2011. Yeah, and then we kind of looked up and we had kids and families and a bunch of Ford trucks in the parking lot and less Mustang. And so we started to go to the brands that we were already carrying and list their F-150 stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I went out and got a 11 EcoBoost two-wheel drive and we got an edge tuner and we started tuning it. Mm -hmm. And that was huge i mean we started posting our results online um you know i don't even think edge quite knew what they had created <laughs> yeah but we were putting on 100 extra foot pounds it was it was amazing yeah so well and that's it's interesting too because i mean at that point in time the EcoBoost was still a really new motor uh and it was a new concept for a lot of people that weren't like maybe super into the idea of a twin turbo v6 f-150 from factory and we were sort of the first people to jump in and start tuning it and playing with it and really like working on that idea and I think that's part of why it took off like he says because we discovered the potential and it's like we can build on this yeah yeah I think so um, and we were posting at that point we were doing a lot of fuel mileage numbers um, and then pretty naturally we got into you know exhaust mm -hmm. suspension wheels and tires the customers kind of drove all that as soon as they built the performance side they would start asking us for other brands so we expanded our line um, 
as soon as we got into the suspension, now the 5.0 guys want to buy from us, so then we started doing a lot of 5.0 stuff. We had that 2012 uh, 5.0 F-150, we put the Pro Charger on. Mm -hmm. I think we said we had 17 exhaust systems on that. Yeah, so, we moved through a lot yeah. with that truck. So we were one of the first people to go out and just say, apples to apples, we're just going to compare these over and over mm -hmm. and over. We did the same drives, the same accelerations, and um, I think the community was begging for that. They needed someone to do that. The manufacturers like to put out videos that show their stuff in the best light, and mm -hmm. so I think we did a good job of just comparing them and just letting the customer decide what they wanted to buy. Um, that was also, that 2012 truck was kind of the first time we really started building a, like a, an off-road truck that we could go out and use and test, like even with wheels and suspension, tires yeah, and stuff like the, that too. Yeah, that Icon Stage 1 or Stage 2 on it, and yeah. that was the first time, you know, I remember running it up through Prescott, that mm -hmm. we had really went out and filmed us beating on them. You know, yeah. a lot of the trucks before that we were out using every weekend, but we never took the time to go film it and to mm -hmm. post it, and so that created some really good reviews. And then, like I said, the customer drives it. They say, okay, how does yeah. it compare to this suspension? So we'd go out and put that one on, and it's kind of grown from there. Um, so about that time, we were in a 20,000-square-foot warehouse. We were doing, uh, stocking a lot of product. We were doing retail. We were doing content. And it's that time that we get Noah. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you want to tell them how all that happened? Yeah. Uh, so where I kind of came into the company was at the very bottom, just working in the warehouse, pushing boxes around. Uh, and it, I mean, before that, I'd been doing odds and ends jobs with like landscaping and working with repo companies and things like that. Uh, and so this was a job that basically came from my dad who talked to you, wanted to buy yep. a bumper off one of your F-150s, came down and then said, hey, my son needs a job, uh, what do you got? <laughs> <laughs> sent me down there with my resume. It's like, cool, I can push boxes. Yep. Uh, and so from there, as the company continued to build and grow, I kind of grew with it and moved into uh, sales and then uh, a little bit of customer service in there and then from sales out into photography and now obviously into video and kind of the production side of things. So yep. it's just been moving along. Um, you did some moving Oh yeah. for us. Yeah, you were, that's You were true. stage three's moving company yeah, for so. a while. <laughs> Yeah, as Bill mentioned before, uh, we've changed locations quite a bit uh, just because the company's been expanding so so much. Uh, and so when I came on, since I was just the kid that could push boxes around, I was like, oh, great. Well, when we need to move, we have other people that need to be on the phones and yeah. doing work. But you can take one of the trucks and start moving things all day long. And so I just go back and forth to wherever the new location was load up the pickup with whatever furniture or things I could take that people inventory, weren't using. I mean, yeah, inventory, yeah. all that stuff, and just haul it off to the other building. Yep. Uh, did that quite a few times. Just built in, built in stage three moving company. Yep, exactly, with the project trucks. Yeah, so we yeah, definitely used the project, the project trucks, we even as moving vehicles. Yeah, exactly. They I don't know if that was part of the testing, but it worked. Yeah, yeah, we got, I got a lot of miles in on the 2011, moving stuff yes. around, and the 2012. Yeah. Um, should we go over some of the vehicles that we showed up in? Yeah, uh, I'll let you kick that off. With my six by six? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I went out and bought a five ton military six by six. So 25 feet long, 25,000 pounds. Um, and I showed up here in that. And that was an interesting vehicle. It was, I think, is stock on 48 inch tires. Yeah, uh, huge truck. Yeah. They're so big in person, it's yeah. incredible. Yeah, I will suggest if you are looking at one of those, get the bobbed one. Take the rear, <laughs> take the two rear <laughs> wheels off, cut the thing shorter. You get like, that's like the best performance mod you can make. You drop yeah. like 7,000 pounds off the thing. <laughs> as long as you don't need six wheel drive or yeah, whatever. Yeah, which fine. you don't. Those things are monsters. So yeah, I showed uh, up in that. Um, yeah, kind of unannounced too. Uh, yeah. I got back from lunch and there was just a <laughs> six by six sitting yeah. out front. Uh, and you drove it down some of the busier roads around Phoenix. And yeah, yep. drove and it down Bell Road. And I always said it was one of those vehicles you had to keep in the middle lane because if someone wanted to stop in front of you and turn, you were just going to run them over. Yeah. Um, that's a, yeah, that's a lose-lose for anybody in the way of a vehicle yeah. like that. Um, but I think you have me beat on oddest thing to show up in. Yeah, I guess as far <laughs> as strange. So uh, probably the weirdest vehicle that I've had is a 1996 Lincoln Town Car Limousine. And it's different from your regular 96 Lincoln Town Car Limousine in that we bought it for $600. <laughs> and by we, I mean two of my buddies uh, chipped in and bought it for $600 off Craigslist. And it was 
all sorts of tore up and disgusting. It had like this awful like pink plaid roof that was kind of like shredded from and sun faded and it had spent its previous life uh, hauling people around from bars. So I, I, God only knows what's <laughs> happened inside of it. Yeah. Uh, that being said, $600 seemed like a deal. So we picked it up anyways and then repainted it with house paint. Uh, did little stars and bars across the top, got 13 stripes, 50 stars. We did uh, a gold Mustang hood scoop that I took from you. Yep. Mounted that yep. up on the hood, a little golden eagle in the grill, some American flags off the front fenders, all sorts of good stuff. Chinese LEDs underneath uh, to light it up like neon. So it really, it came together nicely uh, as long as you were about 20 feet away. Once yeah. you got close, you could So it ran, but there was a list of things that didn't work, right? So we had wipers, lights. Yeah, it did. Yeah, so it AC. did drive. Yeah, it also, <laughs> it also had like 220,000 miles or something like that on it, which seemed like a lot to me for a limousine. That's like, you got to be driving consistently. It's a lot of people passed out in the back. Yeah. It's a lot of miles. But uh, yeah, we took it to San Diego and that was really where we discovered all the things that were wrong with it uh, was on that road trip. So it wasn't till like one or two in the morning as we were like driving through the night that uh, we realized that like the windshield wipers affect the way that the headlights work and you can only use wipers with your high beams. And then also at that point, the headlights decided to uh, blow one of the circuit breakers in the car and it's like a fuse or like a fusible link. It was a, a weird thing Link had did, but blew that. So then we had no lights uh, trying to drive through the desert. And so we we're holding flashlights out the window. Uh, then we also found out that the roof leaked and um, the air conditioning didn't work either. And so we were in that weird area of hitting monsoon season where it would be like 100 degrees during the day. Uh, and then it could also just turn to straight up storms and flooding. Mm -hmm. And so we got to get both ends of that of being extremely hot and sweaty and also uh, extremely gross and wet as the roof leaked on us while it poured down raining. <laughs> wow. It was excellent. Wow. Yeah. Um, so recently you got the forward control. Yep. Yeah, big which, improvement over the limo. Yeah, I guess, yeah, <laughs> in some forms, uh, which some of you guys have maybe seen that video. We uh, did some towing with our blue 5.0 to pull the forward control when I went to go pick it up. Uh, but yeah, it's a it's cool. It's definitely got a bit more street cred than a limo does, yeah. uh, but it's less reliable, significantly less reliable than the limo. Yeah. And then you've had some other things. Obviously, the 6x6 wasn't really the end of your yeah. <laughs> escapades yeah, and buying so, uh, vehicles through and through a car guy. Um, mm -hmm. I've showed up in a CJ7 with no top on it, which mm -hmm. I still have, which I like. Um, yeah, really cool CJ7. Uh, 66 Chevelle, mm -hmm. some of that other stuff. So I like my older cars and my big blocks and all that. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to tell them a little bit about the rally you just did? That's oh, a, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty, I don't know that that's the term for it. Yeah, rally is a vague The, term. the event you went to <laughs> for participating <laughs> in it. A gathering. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so some of you might be familiar with the Gambler 500, which kind of originated up in Oregon as sort of an off-road rally event uh, where people buy vehicles for like $500 or less and then modify them and go rally through the woods for like three days. And so it's grown up. It's, kind of blown up and expanded now. And there's a lot of different sub events that are Gambler 500 uh, style and they happen all over the US. And so there was one recently that happened here in Arizona. And so a buddy of mine had picked up a Geo Metro that had been in a front end collision, but still <laughs> ran uh, and just kind of modified it, put it, welded up some bumpers for it, threw a roof rack on there, stripped out the back seats and all that. And was like, hey, you know, you should come be my co-pilot and then, you know, we'll bring my dad's truck as like a chase vehicle should things go terribly wrong and <laughs> go run it around. So we went and drove for three days all over northern Arizona, up around like Lake Roosevelt and uh, Globe and over four peaks and all that stuff in this little Geo Metro that had Honda Civic tires up front because that was upsizing. Was I like it. Or Accord, excuse me, Accord <laughs> wheels and tires on the front with the Geo tires on the back and just ripped around. And it was impressive how capable that little car was. And was it you guys or someone else that you showed me a picture had the, uh, the street sign skid plates? Oh, yeah, we did have street sign skid plate on the front. And then there was a couple other vehicles there that had those as well. Uh, there was some wild stuff. There was a Pontiac Fiero that did the, the trip with us. Uh, a massive, uh, like, stretched F... 500 or something ridiculous, just all sorts of weird vehicles uh, that people picked up that were total garbage. Some yeah. Mustangs, 90s Mustangs and yeah. Camaros. Where they're just hacking out fenders and throwing 35s on it. Absolutely, like, yeah. We have like the the morning of the race, all you hear is like generators running and people with uh, sawzalls just chopping pieces off their vehicles to make things fit. 
Sounds like something we might need to do. Yeah. You know, pick up like an old Ford truck and just mm -hmm. see if we put it on 40s and go to town. We should get a Festiva. I like the Ford truck idea uh, a lot better. <laughs> you guys decide. Ford truck or Festiva. You know what the good decision is. On there. 40s. Yeah, on 40s. Uh, okay, so we've ha we had a couple feature vehicles. We built a uh, 2007 GT Mustang. Mm -hmm. We had Roush's first TVS supercharger with their first uh, forged crate motor on it. Mm -hmm. And that ended up in Dub Magazine. Um, we yeah, had a small achievement there. Yeah, I mean, we had um, six piston front and rear from bare brakes on it. And we tracked that car. We used to do some track days with customers, and that was always a lot of fun. Uh, we built a EcoBoost F-150 on Truck U. Uh, so we went down to Florida and, ha and watched them film that, and they did one of our power packages on it. Um, and what's new? So what are we doing? recently yeah so uh like bill said we've had a lot of those other vehicles and some of those you can still see the project pages on our site if you're looking for details on them but yeah recently some of the big builds that you guys may have been following are going to be things like the raptor behind us which we've been putting quite a bit of time into as well as our 2019 ranger uh and then we've also still been kind of piling on parts and making adjustments to our 2018 f-150 that lightning blue 50 that we did uh, the budget build with we've kind of expanded past that now and thrown like falcon suspension on there and some new tires and different things and done some lighting upgrades but uh, as far as like what's been going around the shop super recently uh, you can't really tell and i think maybe that's good we'll tease it out for you guys but we have been doing some more work on the raptor since you guys last saw it and we did get a uh, rooftop tent on there as well as a rci bed rack and some roto packs and things so starting to kind of overland that build a little bit uh, it's a little bit excessive maybe for an overland build. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how many people are trying to go camping at 110 miles an hour yeah. off-road, but if you are, this will be the truck for it. Yeah. So we're looking forward to bringing some more content on that pretty soon. And then uh, also just recently finished up doing a BDS leveling kit on the Ranger. Yep. And so uh, we're getting some tires and stuff put on there. We'll have that ready to roll fairly soon where we can get out and test it and really wheel it, which I'm pretty excited about. And then uh, you guys have seen some of the videos that have gone up for lighting and things like that on the blue truck. So we've been plenty busy around here getting uh, odds and ends done on these trucks. But uh, I think some of the bigger stuff will definitely happen once we have the Ranger out on the trails and uh, get the Raptor out with this stuff, too. The other, I guess, big new thing around the shop is the shop. So True. This, uh, this is all pretty new for us. You've seen it for the last couple of months in videos. But... Um, mm -hmm. We finally got a nice place to shoot inside and got a lift, and so we're doing some lighter installs here, mm -hmm. and um, it's just giving us a lot more options. Yeah, nice. absolutely. Yeah, in the, in the past, we've been a little bit more limited, or we've had to use our buddy Joe's shop for different installs and things, and so this has given us the ability to really focus in here and get stuff done, uh, and also we can control lighting better and can have a better idea of uh, what we need tools-wise, so it continues to build and grow, but having the lift and everything has been huge really really nice upgrade for us um should we move to ford news yeah i think i start talking about some news mm -hmm. so uh we'll kick it off with the the rivian deal i think um some of you guys might be aware of rivian who is an electric truck startup that's been in the news quite a bit lately because they're doing things a little bit more uniquely and that they're trying to build electric vehicles that are made for outdoorsy people or people that want to off-road or go out and fish and camp and things like that. Basically all the things that we like and the stuff we build yeah. our trucks for, they're trying to do it with an all-electric vehicle. So as opposed to other companies like Tesla that really focus more on city driving and people who are strictly on-road and making family cars, Rivian's going a little bit different direction with it. That being said, uh, kind of the, I guess it's sort of old news in a sense now, but the biggest recent things that have happened is Amazon invested like $700 million into Rivian, and then Ford actually invested $500 million into Rivian and is wanting to use their skateboard platform, which is kind of like the underlying chassis of the vehicle and their like sort of powertrain setup, uh, to make an all-electric F-150, which is a pretty interesting concept. I didn't yeah. really expect Ford to do anything like that. <laughs> and with a lot of these little startups like Rivian, um, they don't always hang on and they're not always super well structured. So it says something about Rivian that Ford's interested in them and that they've been able to make enough waves to get that kind of attention. That's what I thought. I was kind of surprised that Ford wouldn't go out and just do their own thing. Yeah. But I think, I do think some of it plays into what you were saying about the skateboard and what they were doing originally with that skateboard and what people were finding. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, which is a good note. So Rivian 
built their truck on the same wheelbase as like a crew cab uh, short bed F-150. And so when they were testing the skateboard initially, they were putting Ford bodies on top of it instead of using a Rivian body, which is kind of funny. Uh, and people noticed that there was these F-150s driving around getting plugged in and charged, uh, and they didn't have exhaust pipes and things. And they're like, oh, Ford's making an electric truck. This is crazy. Uh, and then Ford was like, that's not us. Uh, <laughs> so it kind of came out that it was Rivian using it as test mules, but now the tie-in's a little bit stronger there, and you can see why Ford would be interested in using yeah. a platform that's already kind of dialed into the shape and size of a yes. truck they have. Yes. Um, so we were both interested in this, and then we went to the Overland Expo mm -hmm. uh, two weeks ago now, yeah, and, like um, and we got to see the vehicle, and mm -hmm. that was really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was amazed talking to those guys, how well thought out it was, how good it looked, um, just the details and, and the questions that I had, they were really willing to answer. I think they showed, they talked to us about a price point for like 69, which I didn't think was terrible. Yeah. That was with the lower battery pack. I think they were talking about 320 mile range. Yeah, um, these, from what I remember, it's it can be anywhere from like 250 miles to 400 miles of range, depending on what battery pack option yeah. you go with. So it'll be interesting to see how well those numbers hold up in real world or how that, I guess, how that system breaks down for how they package the vehicles. I don't know, but 400 mile range would be pretty impressive, especially on a yeah. truck like that. And if you can load it up with gear and maintain something similar, that'd be pretty good. So, and I had a concern about the batteries, uh, you know, if you're out camping or whatever and you're just opening doors all the time, and that's a different battery pack. Mm -hmm. So all your accessory stuff like that. So you could kill that battery when you're out there, but it wouldn't kill your ability to drive home, which yeah. I thought was interesting. Um, and I don't know that I remember all of this, but they had a pretty interesting story about um, going to a town in Illinois and that they were using an old shutdown auto oh, warehouse or whatever. Yeah. It um, used to be like a GM plan of some sort. Yeah, I think so it, it kind of had like that that original Detroit auto feel to their story, which yeah. you know, I'm, I'm sure they're very well aware of, but mm -hmm. um, it was really interesting to see that they were you know, um, employing like 1,100 people in that town and how mm -hmm. you know, it had really helped that town. And it was, it was yeah, a, that town was dependent on the factory that had went out of business, yes. and now Rivian kind of reinvigorated it by bringing it back, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it was. I liked, I liked talking about that. The one they had up there, you can find pictures online, it was kind of their like camping version for the Overland one, so they had mm -hmm. a drawer that pulled out the side. They had all yeah, the kitchen. Yeah, had a full kitchen, slide yeah. out in it, had a rooftop tent off the back, yep. a lot of neat stuff they did there. Um, but I think it's worth noting too, so, as interested as we were, I don't think you and I are really sold yet where either one of us would go out and buy one or convert to an electric vehicle. We're both yeah. pretty tried and true yeah. <laughs> combustion engine enthusiasts, but, yeah. uh, but it is a fascinating thing to see happen and watch Rivian grow, and I, maybe there could be, be more potential for this in the future. I did think it was interesting too, so one of the biggest things that I think you and I come back to and a lot of the people we've talked to around the shop come back to is if you take an electric vehicle off-road like that, um, a, what does reliability look like and what happens mm -hmm. when it breaks down? But B, or possibly more importantly, is uh, what happens if you run out of juice and you're out in the middle of nowhere? And like, how do you charge up before you go off onto a trail? Like, what does that look like? Yeah. Uh, but Rivian made, uh, the gentleman we were talking to actually made an interesting point of Rivian's actually looking to try and build some charging stations right. in like national parks or near towns that have a lot of trailheads. So you might see a charging station, maybe like Moab or something. Yeah. So that way you have the ability to fill up quote unquote, yeah. before going out and hitting a trail, which you'll still have to be cautious. I don't, yeah. There's no electric jerry cans yet, but, but they it would give you the ability to go out and hit a trail. It's an interesting two. challenge for them because everyone mm -hmm. else says, well, we'll just piggyback on the universal stuff that's all in town. And so yeah. that makes a lot of sense. And one of their challenges, we can use that for X amount of percent of people or whatever, mm -hmm. but we still have to get into the outlying areas if that's what we want. So that's going to exactly. be a challenge. Yeah, exactly. So they've they've definitely got some work to do in expanding infrastructure and everything. But I'm I'm rooting for them. I'd like to see something become of it. Uh, if if we're going to do electric vehicles and that's where things have to head, then I would like for it to head in a direction where I can still go off road and yes. go camping. Yeah, exactly. So. Uh, I think he said they were taking pre-orders now, and they were they were serious about delivery sometime next year, which yeah. seems pretty quick. Yeah. But, but yeah, it was it was beautiful truck. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it really I was. mean, it did. It's a like. A pretty well like full-fledged vehicle that wasn't like a loose concept or just some rolling shell that they no, had there no, i mean no. these are like built out functioning yeah. trucks so yeah. they've got a lot of the development done but uh yeah i'll be interested to see like how that turns out and then how it pans out with ford making an f-150 on that platform what that will look like or what things will change yeah i'd be interested to see you know how it deals with water 
I mean, mm -hmm. when we were up last time in Williams, I was all excited to drive our trucks through creeks and all everything else. And we all know that electronics usually don't like water. So how does yeah. that deal with, you know, right now you can bury an F-150 past the lugs and you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. But it, it'd just be interesting to see how that is going to handle that stuff. Because if you want us, if you want to give us the ability to go off road, then it has to be the real ability to go off road. We're yeah. not talking about going down a trail at a park. Yeah, you know? exactly. Rolling into like a designated campsite where yeah. it's just like gravel the whole way. Yeah. I totally agree. Um, you pick the next topic. Cool. Well, I guess from there, the other kind of hot thing that's been going around from Ford is everybody talking about the Bronco. And especially, I think it was just yesterday, yesterday yeah, that there was some other images released, and I saw some articles on a test mule Bronco, which is basically looked like just a single cab Raptor, which is also a cool concept. So Ford, I don't know if you were thinking about making a single cab Raptor, but but do do that. <laughs> uh, but people are saying it's probably more so to test some sort of Bronco chassis or something along those lines, which is interesting too, because the Bronco is supposedly Ranger based. And we saw some ugly like test mule photos of what was probably a Ranger Bronco. Uh, so then it makes you wonder if there's gonna be two versions or how that'll pan out. Yeah, I mean, you've got their look, I think we're still talking 2020 for the Bronco. If that's the case, I'm I'd am be surprised if we're in test mule. Mode. Yeah. I would think they would be very close to production, which kind of makes me wonder if that's not the test mule for the SVT version of the Bronco, which could be another year or so sure. away. Um, but yeah, that thing was beautiful. So mm -hmm. five, five bed, single cab, Raptor. Um, yeah, still all the flared fenders and yeah, everything. Was, they had the tough. like 34s on it or yep. 35s and it was really cool looking yeah. truck. If nothing else, I'll buy it when they're done. Yeah, you exactly. Know, I'll take that yeah, if you're looking for a place for that test wheel to go, yeah. it'll go here. Um, yeah, pretty neat. I know also uh, there's been stuff leaked about kind of a baby Bronco where they were going to make a version that was maybe more road friendly and smaller, more compact, as well as an authentic off-road version. And I don't know how that'll pan out or if that's like where this Raptor comes in as being the more off-roady version. Yeah. But I think you're you're right on it possibly being like a Ford Performance yeah. kind of special edition or something. So we are hearing pretty solid information that there's going to be a straight axle, mm -hmm. which is amazing. Um, Ford's confirmed removable doors and roof, mm -hmm. which means... Which is also huge. They're aiming right at Jeep, yeah. which I like because Jeep just got into the truck market. Mm -hmm. So I feel like <laughs> yeah, Ford the owes them a little something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm glad to see that that they really took a shot at Jeep because I think mm -hmm. that the Ranger took a great shot at Tacoma. Mm -hmm. They did a really good job with that. I think it might take a year or so, but um, it's going to be really interesting to see how Ford does with their fit and finish, yeah. their tech, all that stuff in a very similar thing to Jeep. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it's been a while since somebody's come out with a real hardcore Wrangler competitor that has solid axles and removable doors and tops. Like we've seen some other vehicles and like Toyota makes a lot of very capable off-road trucks that are independent front suspension. Uh, not quite the same, still good, just different. And so this will be pretty interesting to see how it stacks up. You can say it. FJ. The FJ is the best competitor, <laughs> yes. Uh, and that does do not have, exist. Yeah, exactly, that they no longer make anymore. But yeah, the FJ was an excellent Jeep competitor, and I know a lot of people have issues with it, and it is independent front suspension, but still a very, very capable vehicle. And I do have skin in the game there because I own one, but <laughs> it's unstoppable. <laughs> Just is what it is. But I do think Ford has potential to make something similar. And then maybe that will influence Toyota to get, you know, get back in the game and work on something new, which I would like. FJ 2.0. Yeah. But, <laughs> Um, yeah, so I mean, Bronco, I think they're pretty solidly talking about 2.3 liter EcoBoost. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to see 5.0 with 10 speed. Yeah. And I just think uh, older Bronco, they just sound amazing. Mm -hmm. Always you come up behind one's a 302. Oh, yeah. So I think the 5.0 would be really popular. I would love to have that. Yeah, Ford's got a lot better powertrain options that they could fit in there than what the Jeep has, especially with like the older Pentastar motors and things. Yeah. Uh, and then I think the Ford build quality and reliability is a lot nicer than what we've been used to seeing from Chrysler. <laughs> Granted, the newer Jeeps and things are really like pretty well put together and they yeah. look good, but that stuff only lasts for so long and they do have a tendency to rattle apart and things are very plasticky. And but... their tech is getting better pretty yeah, quickly, it, it but is. I still don't think it's on Ford's level. Yeah, so yeah, I agree. Um... Well, uh, we're getting pretty close to wrapping up on time here, so I think we, that's probably about all the news we have room to cover at the moment. But uh, with that being said, guys, we appreciate you tuning in if you've been hanging out and watching. And uh, if you're watching this after it's already gone live, as I said at the beginning of the show, we'd love to hear from you guys. If you want to leave some comments or you want to go on social media and let us know what you thought of the stream, 
Uh, we do want to maybe make this something that happens once a month, twice a month, uh, and talk about you know more Ford news, more stuff, what's going on around the shop, mm -hmm. or maybe do some more informational topics, things like that. Uh, but this was kind of a test run to feel it out. And so if you guys enjoyed it, we definitely want to hear from you. And if you didn't enjoy it or you have suggestions, we want to hear those too. Yeah. Um, and if you're going to complain about the FJ, then I don't want to hear any of it because it's <laughs> an excellent vehicle. Uh, so that being said, I think that's a, that's a wrap. Yeah, thank you.